Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. I hope you all got your coffee and all that stuff. Uh, I'm curious, how many of you came, uh, signed up before the announcement? So, yeah. Um, so we're doing a little bit of switcheroo uh, now that we've announced our Dynamo and Open Search integration. Uh, we'll be talking about that today. My name is John Handler. I am a solutions architect with AWS, been with AWS about 13 years, focusing on search for all of those years. I am joined by... Jason Hunter. I'm a solution architect with DynamoDB, and so together on stage you have exactly what we're announcing, which is DynamoDB and open search working together. Great. So uh, Jason's going to kick us off and uh, talk a little bit about Dynamo. All right. I assume you all are kind of DynamoDB people, right? Anyone an open search person? I think we could take you. <laughs> All right. I'll do the first half of this, talking about the DynamoDB side, and then John will take the second half talking about a deep dive on the open search side. So you know the value probably of DynamoDB, right? When you want low latency at any scale, DynamoDB is a great choice. It was built for that. It was built originally for the Amazon.com shopping cart, where you want to be able to store an item in the cart, see what's in your cart, 24-7, nonstop, really low latency. And from there, it's just uh, ballooned out to now we have more than a million customers. And you really don't have to worry about the throughput. You don't have to worry about the, the size. Someone says, can I go to a petabyte? Absolutely, you can. And it just seems to you like the serverless system, there are servers behind the scenes, but you'd never know, right? You say you want to get this many requests per second, we give it to you. You don't have to worry about how the servers work. It has four nines of availability in one region, five nines of availability if you use global tables where you get active-active replication between multiple regions, and it's pretty distinct in having that in the NoSQL space. Uh, you have a whole lot of robust enterprise features from encryption and uh, point-in-time recovery. If you ever make a mistake, deletion protection is one of the new ones. If you're new, if you haven't been uh, keeping up on what was announced so far this year, deletion protection is good. Put that on your production tables. It's like uh, before you launch the missiles, you have to flip up the little plastic thing. It's like that. Before you delete your table, you have to turn off deletion protection. You can't have a cloud formation accidentally delete your table. Uh, it is also, I think, a very popular database because of the native integration with a lot of AWS services. We list some of them here. You can do Lambda triggers, right? Just say, when an event happens in the database, I want to invoke Lambdas and do something particular. Uh, I am. You don't have a password. It's just role-based. Integration with CloudWatch. Uh, S3 for exports and now incremental exports. I want to plug that, which was released about a month ago. Now, instead of just doing full exports, you can choose to do an incremental and see the delta between you know anything as small as 15 minutes up to 24 hours. And there's a wide variety here, but one that has been missing until yesterday was something like Open Search, and that was, was that was announced in yesterday's keynote. So we're going to deep dive on how that works today. And to do that, we've we got to get some data. So John and I got together and we're thinking, what's a good data set? We found this product question and answer, which is one of the open data sets that's available. You get about 17 gigabytes. You can download it. And these are real questions that happened uh, on Amazon.com. And so I just want to work through the schema here. We'll do the DynamoDB design, and then we'll see what we could do if we integrate with OpenSearch. So we have an ASIN, which is the Amazon ID. That's your product ID. Every product in the catalog has one of those. It has a question ID has a, a text of the question, some answers, some details of the product that was being asked about. And then we, because we want to show off extra features, added things like the uh, answerer's age and location and gender, which we, is totally not something you'd know, but we faked it using uh, a fake library. And so this is what we get from a JSON point of view. What would uh, we need to do in DynamoDB? The classic stuff, right? This is, I've got a, a product catalog, I've got a billion items, I have more than a billion questions and answers. <clears throat> my access patterns, I want to know in DynamoDB in advance, right? Because you design your schema to make your access patterns efficient. I want to get all the questions and answers for an ASIN. So I'm going to show my catalog page for this product. Here's the Q&A. I want to get that section. Maybe you're going to ask a question. I need to add that to the ASIN. Maybe I, you do an answer to a question. I'm going to add that under the question ID. Classic stuff. I want to do this. Unlimited scale, low latency, good stuff, right? How do I design it? If you've been doing DynamoDB for a while, you're probably already picturing what I'm going to do here. I make the ASIN the partition key, because that's the, I want to do that query that says, give me all the Q&A for an ASIN. So if, if the ASIN's the partition key, I go and I do a query against that partition key. 
Under there, I have a sort key of metadata, whatever name. That means this is metadata about the product. It's the name. I have queen sheets, six-piece bed sheets, all right. And then I have a question as a different sort key with the question and then the question ID in the sort key name for convenience because under this ASIN I might have different questions, so this organizes them together. And Q, that was your pick, I believe. You were like, I like Q for the question. So okay, Q indicates that's the question. Are these sheets noisy? I know that's a weird, it's a weird uh, question, but there it is. <laughs> this is real data. We, we, we can't make this up. We can make up the user's let and long, but we can't make up the question text. I mean, we did, by the way, uh, look at the sheets and pillowcases uh, product category, right? right? So all of our examples, sheets and pillowcases. We thought that would be something for a change, uh, wouldn't be the usual electronics or what have you, so. Exactly. And so um, then the answer there, it says answer 0001 uh, for this text. And sometimes you denormalize that way so that if I wanted to pull out the answer, I'd also have the text of the question. Uh, and this one says no noise at all. And this is a 97-year-old male who's at this lat long. All right. Random number generator. What can I tell <laughs> I <know. laughs> With a max of 100. All right, so life is good, and I am going along, and I'm in production for a year, and I am loving DynamoDB because I am able to do this. I don't have to worry. Uh, if you say, what if there's an a order of magnitude more traffic? No problem. What if there's an order of magnitude more data? No problem. That's one of the perks of DynamoDB, right? That you can sleep well knowing that it's designed to handle that scale because I've got a really good cardinality partition key. And if you've got that good cardinality PK, you know that you can scale great. But now, product management comes. You know how they are, and they say, we have some new requirements for you. Uh, people want to do some text. We'd like to find the Q&A that contains certain words or phrases. Oh. And I'd like to sort that according to some custom relevance algorithm that boosts according to the proximity of the words and maybe the location of the words. And I want to get a histogram chart of the results so I can see how the reviews have been over time. Has it gone down in quality lately based on the Q&A? And who's the most frequent answerer? Could I, across maybe all questions, find out who I should reward because they're doing a great job with Q&A? Uh, maybe I want to limit to people who are like me, people who are uh, in my age range, of my gender, from my area, right? Maybe I don't want to just search for uh, the text, but I want to search for a semantic meaning. So maybe the, the words I'm querying for aren't exactly there, but you get the idea. Huh, what do you do as a DynamoDB person right now? You're thinking, these are not things that are, you know, built for DynamoDB to, to answer, right? These are things that OpenSearch is great at, right? Hey, I'm here for you, buddy. <laughs> That's right. So OpenSearch, and I'll, I'll introduce his product. OpenSearch <laughs> service is a fantastic service that does exactly these things we just listed here, where you can do a search, and you can do the text and the stemming and the case sensitivity and the proximity and the relevance ordered. It's a search system. So when you want to do a search problem, it's a search system, as well as analytics. When you want to get that histogram chart or count something, you can do it there. And vector databases integrates with that. So you're getting, hey, what are we doing in the vector space? Open search is, is right out of the box and indexed there, right? And cost effective, and we have, John will talk about more, a serverless offering there too. So if you like the serverless nature of DynamoDB, which I hope you all do, then we're going to get serverless on the open search side too. How do we integrate this? This is the classic integration. We've, some of you maybe have done this. I've done this, right? Don't take pictures of this. This is the before. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> not, or if you do, like, just delete. Like, no, not, not anymore. But we're going to talk about what we did. So what you would do is you would do a snapshot probably to S3. You can push a button. Export from DynamoDB into an S3 location as compressed JSON or ION files, and now you've got a copy of your data. You didn't have to do any compute, it just shows up. Then you import that into OpenSearch, okay? Now the application, while you're doing this, is still writing, so you have to watch for that and you have to continuously keep updated, and so we turn on streams for the database. And the streams, we can then play all the activity since the time of the snapshot, push that into OpenSearch, and now we're caught up, continuing the updates, the Lambda keeps running. Now you're running the Lambda, it's up to you, right? And it's not the worst, but it's not the best because this is all undifferentiated work. And we don't like pushing undifferentiated work on you, right? We'd rather you just be able to say, hook these two up, here's a little declaration, go. I don't wanna think about compute, I don't wanna, I just want it to be done for me, 
right? I assume a lot of you would probably rather push a button and say do it for me than have to maintain your Lambda and think about the Python 3.7 deprecations or anything like that that's, that's in your business. So announcing, this was in yesterday's keynote, DynamoDB, zero ETL integration with open search service. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> for YouTube, let's, woo! <laughs> this is really great stuff. Uh, it's, it's designed to work kind of the same way underneath. Right, where it's gonna do a bootstrap, so you have to turn on Pitter so that it can do the bootstrap, and stream so that it can do the continuous streaming, but it's auto-scaling in the middle. And that way you, you can scale from OCUs, John will talk about, but from one to 96 OCUs, so it'll automatically adjust according to the traffic that's coming in, and you don't have to do the code. You do a configuration, but you don't have to write any code, and it's really powerful because it's built on open search ingestion. And if you are from the open search side, it's built on data prepper. And data prepper is this, uh, like open search ingestion was released like March, April this year, right? Correct. And data prepper is a couple years old before that. Uh, data prepper is actually, yeah, about a year old. Right, so these are, these are not just brand new things that were as part of this. It's built on existing tech stack, and so you get all the capabilities that data prepper has had and has been maturing. It's on like 2.5 release or something like that now. So serverless, the open search can be serverless, DynamoDB serverless, the middle part, the integration, serverless with data prepper, uh, very cost effective, and it's open source. So you can go see the documentation is open source, you can see the code is open source, and all this. And what that means is that you get a rich set of processors to uh, control how the data is uh, managed between the two. So you can do things like I want to rename a key, I have it called this in Dynamo, but I'd rather have it be called this in my search index. Maybe I'm going to add a new entry that's created out of a combination of DynamoDB entries. We're gonna show that for Latin long becoming a location. All right, so we had Latin long in the DynamoDB, but OpenSearch wants a singular location, so we can do that. You can do routing, so you can say this data goes to that index, this data goes in that index. So if you're doing single table design, you can say, well, these entities go there and these entities go there, and even if it's in one DynamoDB table, I can make it look like it's in different indexes if I so choose. And with sub-pipelines, which is how you know that this is really robust, that you can have data go into pipelines, which has its own uh, configuration and flow. And some things like aggregations, too, where it can do some uh, counting and look for anomalies and things like that as the data's going. So if you say, if there's a lat long that doesn't fit on Earth, let me know about that in advance and it has native understanding of things like CSV and JSON. So mature data prepper in between, but now our diagram is simplified where we just put the zero ETL solution in between DynamoDB and OpenSearch. This is your photo op. <laughs> but it should be so simple you maybe don't need the photo. Right. <laughs> right, so you set up the pipeline between the two, and I'll show you uh, the console shortly, and it's just done for you. It knows how to do an export, it knows how to do the streaming, it will keep it in sync, serverless in between, using open search ingestion based on data prepper. There you go. So the experience from a DynamoDB point of view is on the left side, now you're gonna have a new thing saying integrations. This is the, the first one that's in production. We also saw Redshift 1 announced yesterday. Uh, you create pipeline, and what you're going to do after that is you get a declaration in YAML format, which is how you want the data to flow. And just, this is what you basically think. There's a source. So I'm going to say, I'm gonna come from this table ARN. I have a stream, always say latest right now. Export to this bucket, this prefix. You can pick that. And here's my role that I want to use. You have to set up a role for this. So all right, I'm gonna pull from DynamoDB of this table name. I have a processor opportunity, where in this case I'm going to create that location based off the user Latin long. So remember it was two attributes in DynamoDB. I want it to be one key in OpenSearch, so here it is. And that way I can index by geography, and, and John will actually show you a query that does that in his section. So different things like this, and you can have as complex as you need. And then a sync which is the open search index you wanna to go to. So I'm saying I'm gonna to write to open search. You could also sync to something like S3, and one of our best practices for you is it's nice to do that because then you get another copy in S3 of what's been going over the wire, right? Kind of for a debugging point of view. But I'm going to go to open search at this host with this index. I want my document ID to be the primary key that I have in my DynamoDB, which would be the ASIN and the question IDs and whatnot. And here's the role for the sync and the region. And that's it, I declare that in YAML, goes from here, process like this to go to there, and I have it in OpenSearch. 
Are you ready for the fun stuff? Um, so honestly, uh, I've been waiting for, I've built a lot of those Lambda pipelines, and, and this is super exciting for me uh, to, to get this really easy integration. Open search and search engines classically have always been tandem with a database. Search engines really in the beginning were designed because databases couldn't handle the throughput and didn't have the latency to serve search requests. So you offloaded into a database, uh, offloaded into a search engine to provide that low latency, high throughput solution that could also then give you rich results. And you know, this pattern, Dynamo and OpenSearch, is a very common pattern. It's another one of these kind of tandem designs where you want to have each component serving its purpose, uh, where Dynamo is really going to be probably your system of record. It's going to provide you with the durable store, consistent low latency, and ability to uh, hold your data. And then Amazon Open Search Service or Open Search is going to provide you with that rich search experience. And the differentiator and, and part of what Open Search brings is a notion of relevance and ranking and a notion of, of bringing the best results to the top. Uh, Jason also mentioned the uh, ability to do numerics and analytics, uh, the ability to search within text and bring up those relevant results. So we're always going to have this kind of uh, tandem solution. In, in a, the best world, you'll index what you want to search and then you'll use the primary key, uh, you'll store that in open search, and then you'll go back to Dynamo when you need to hydrate the record uh, to display in your UI or what have you. As Jason mentioned, we do have a couple of different deployment options. So we have managed domains where you specify a set of hardware. We go and run that hardware, deploy open search for you, and uh, keep the lights on, monitor, heal, all of that stuff. But there's a deeper level of control you have that can help with cost optimization, optimal scaling, performance, and all of that. Uh, we have our serverless solution as well. Serverless takes away a lot of the details I'm about to go into and makes it really simple to just use open search uh, at a REST endpoint. So I am going to dive a little bit into the uh, service architecture because it's kind of important to get the mental model right, and as, as you are flowing your data from Dynamo, you're going to want to think about how do I size and scale OpenSearch to be able to take that data, right? So OpenSearch uh, is a distributed solution. It runs in a cluster on a set of data nodes. The data nodes, anybody guess? Hold the data, do the indexing, do the query processing. Uh, we have a number of different roles within our clusters. And by the way, cluster is called a domain. In the service, domain just wraps the open search cluster with a bunch of uh, management and all of that. We front everything with a load balancer. Uh, that's where open search's REST API, you can interact with it there. We also have open search dashboards. This is a, a UI on top of open search that enables you to build visualizations, uh, dashboards, and things like that. For those, we provide SAML and Cognito and IAM integration for login. We have a bunch of integrations on the backside also, uh, out to CloudTrail and CloudWatch, and then in from uh, Firehose and MSK, uh, and now in from DynamoDB. So OpenSearch, as I said, is a distributed solution. Uh, so it's a distributed database. The main uh, collection type is the index. So when you send your data to OpenSearch, each object is a document. Document is a JSON, uh, a JSON document with key value pairs. You send that document to your index. OpenSearch is going to index all of those values and make them searchable. Now, an index is comprised of a set of shards. Um, OpenSearch decomposes the index into pieces. So if I have one index and three primary shards, each primary shard is a third of my data. You have primaries and then you have a uh, dynamic set of replicas that you can uh, specify. OpenSearch will take all of those shards and deploy them onto the data nodes uh, in your cluster. They are not one-to-one -one necessarily. 
So open search will distribute the shards across the available nodes. The nodes will provide the compute. The shards are actually the place where the compute is used. Um, you can have multiple shards on single data nodes. So open search balances all of that and puts it onto those nodes for you. When, as I said, the table in DynamoDB corresponds to the index in OpenSearch. So as we lay out the data in DynamoDB, you have items. In OpenSearch, oops. In OpenSearch, you have an index, and then within the index, you have documents. In Dynamo, you have a primary and a, well, you have primary key, partition, and sort. In OpenSearch, you have a document with a single ID. In Dynamo, your items have attributes. And in OpenSearch, your document has JSON field value pairs. So one really important thing, these are, these are somewhat different worlds. And as you design for this, you'll have to think about the, the mapping of the um, data layout in Dynamo to the mapping of the data layout in OpenSearch. A very common thing to do is to send each item uh, well, actually, backing up, Dynamo is a per item schema. OpenSearch is a per index schema. So within your index in OpenSearch, you'll have a single schema that applies to every item document. Not every document has to have every field in the schema, but the schema is singular. Um, so when we're doing a mapping, the default and probably where you'll start is to take each Dynamo item and send it to a single index that has uh, all of the items. And to do that pattern, it can be helpful to pop a, a document type. This enables you to filter between your, your sort keys, right? So in Dynamo, I have a sort key, which is a question or an answer or an item. In OpenSearch, then, I have my ID, document ID is my primary key, and then my the, the concatenation of the partition and sort, right? Um, I've added a document type here that tells me that this is an ASIN. This should be fairly legible. This is just a JSON structure that captures this particular ASIN record, right? And it's just key value. Similarly, if we go down to the question level, right? So I have a doc type question. Here you can see my ID goes all the way down to that queue, right? And if I have my uh, answer for each answer, then I have answer 01, answer 02, right? So this is the sort of a very common pattern that I would expect a lot of you would use is, again, to map straight from OpenSearch, uh, sorry, Dynamo to OpenSearch, and then have this kind of uh, tagging that lets you do the kind of searching you want to do. I'm going to take a minute to talk about some, the core algorithm of OpenSearch like how search engines work, and, and to get you to a mental model of what kind of querying you can do, what is the performance gonna look like, what goes on inside a search engine. I mean, I personally think search engines are super cool. <laughs> Way better than just a regular old database, right? It's like magic, you go, you wanna buy some sheets, you type, I wanna buy some sheets, and sheets. <laughs> so, um, and, and I, I love this stuff. I find this stuff so, so cool. So, Underneath uh, is a technology called Lucene. Apache Lucene is an open source project, been around for 20-ish years. Um, it is a Java library that reads and writes search indexes. Open search shards actually are Lucene indexes. And each field has its own index. So, I, sorry, in Dynamo we're limited to five indexes. In open search everything is indexed. 20. <clears throat> Sorry? 20. In Dynamo, we're limited to 20 indexes. <laughs> Soft limit. <laughs> My point being, if you, if you want to search it, open search is going to let you search it. There's no, there's no limit on indexing because each field has its own index, right? Um, we have an example here. The full, this is our document. And then, you know, schematically, this is our JSON name value uh, pairs. In open search, you have analysis. For any block of text, OpenSearch is going to apply parsing and language-aware rules 
to pull individual words out of that block of text. The term of art for that is term. So each of those is a term. In a text field, all of those terms are searchable, right? And we'll see. Um, so not only can you search every field, if you have a big block of text, you can find matches interior to that block of text. And Open Search is going to provide a relevance function that's going to bring the best stuff up to the top. So the, the field is analyzed, and we create the inverted index. Inverted index is the main data structure for uh, search engines. And it's called an inverted index. It's, it's kind of not really inverted. Like, if you think about it, we're mapping terms onto the documents that contain those terms. So it's kind of like an index. In a book, you know, I go to Encyclopedia Britannica. I look up Barack Obama. It says go to page 50, 54, whatever, right? Um, so similarly, we have our index that maps onto the set of documents, and that's called a posting list. So when I run a query, how do, we, how do we run a query? Something like Egyptian cotton queen sheet set, right? The first thing we do with a query is we analyze the query. Because we changed what the text looks like, so we have to match it, right? Um, so we analyze the query. In this case, we come out with something that looks the same. We'll see a different example. But to process the query then, I go to the index and I look up each of those terms. This lookup is extremely fast. This is a log n. These are all sorted, so it's binary. Uh, I look it up, and I get the set of posting lists that matches the words that I have. I then apply the logic of the query to do set math to find the intersection or union or uh, negation of all of these sets, and I have my matches. Uh, that merge actually is linear, and so um, You'll, you'll go slower as you have more matches, right? And then finally, I score and sort all of the results. The scoring and sorting is n log n. So for query processing in open search, the more matches you have and the more complex your ranking function, the slower your query goes, right? So matching few things, filtering helps you a lot. It reduces the amount of matches. So look out for filters, they help. Uh, to make the point about text analysis, and again, this is a, a key capability to be able to match these large blocks of text, right? So I have some source text here. It's an 1,100 thread count, Egyptian cotton, sateen, brown and yellow striped sheet set queen. Um, I won't read the whole slide <laughs> at you, uh, but this is, this is an example. Um, if I, Open Search has a number of different analyzers, and again, there's the standard analyzer. Really all it's doing is downcasing and stripping out punctuation. To, to create the set of terms that are matchable, right? I also have language aware analyzers for 34 different languages. And when I apply the English uh, analyzer, you'll see I have some uh, crazy stuff comes out, right? We, we stem these things, for instance, so you can see I-N-C-L-U-D instead of include. Um, and the reason is we wanna match that when I say include, includes, including, included, right? So we do this stemming in the English analyzer that provides us with better matching. And let's look at an example. Again, we take this Egy Egyptian cotton queen sheet set. Uh, it still looks, actually the stemming doesn't apply in this one. Uh, and we match it against that block of text. How we rank and score is a deep subject, but in principle what we do is how many times, how many words did I match? And how rare are those words across all of my data? And that's going to generate my score. So I went into some depth about kind of the algorithm. So again, you can get a kind of mental picture of what's going on in open search while you're doing this searching. Now we really get to the goodies. Here we are, the searching scenarios. So we have a few that we want to go through. Um, our data is, again, the uh, product Q&A data with some randomized uh, latitude, longitude, age, name, they're all random, okay? Um, within open search, again, the, a single index has a schema which is called the mapping, and it's at the index level. So this is an example of an, a mapping here. You can see we have properties. Each field we're going to define with a type. Your field names come from your attribute names in Dynamo. 
It's, the mapping itself controls how OpenSearch is gonna process the data. We have a number of different core types, text fields, as we talked about big blocks of text, keyword fields, these are exact match strings. Um, we have a lot of numerics, dates, geotypes, vector types, all kinds of types in OpenSearch. If you send data to OpenSearch without saying a mapping, OpenSearch will helpfully guess for you. And it's a great way to get started, but OpenSearch's guessing can be a little whimsical. So if you send in data without a mapping, it may get mapped to the wrong type. And then if you try to send more data, it'll fail. Like if you're sending uh, a string to something that the first time you ever did it was a number, and so OpenSearch thought, oh, it's a number, I'll map that as a number, and then a string comes, it's gonna reject that document. Best practice is always set your own mapping. Um, don't let OpenSearch do it for you. And this is the one caution. So again, the, the kind of default assumption is it's a string. And so you, you kind of, again, set your mapping. Now, because we have one uh, mapping on the open search side, and your items may have uh, common names, but have different types, you gotta look out for that. So uh, with open search ingestion and with data prepper, you can actually add, you can prepend uh, and create new fields that have the right names and use those. So what kind of queries can you run? Well, we have full text, relevance, based, searching. We have numeric fields that provide you with the ability to not only match exactly, but to do numeric ranges. When I talk with Jason, apparently numeric ranges is one that um, is, is often requested. Well, you do it in that it would be with a sort key, but sometimes you want two. Yeah. And you can do that with open search. Yep. You, you, can, you can range uh, query against any numeric field, date fields as well. Um, we have geo type that supports bounding box queries, polygon queries, distance queries. Uh, we, we have all kinds of capabilities around geo searching. We talked a little bit in the beginning about vector searching. So OpenSearch has uh, three different vector engines supporting two, actually three different vector algorithms. Um, if you want to use vectors for nearest neighbor search, OpenSearch has uh, got support for that. And there are a number of special queries, um, which I won't go into, but they give you tight control over how you're querying and how, you, how the words are related to one another. Uh, there's a percolate query that inverts the idea of querying. You index the queries and you run documents against them. You can think about a workload that's kind of a real estate workload. I wanna find a house that has four bedrooms and that has a fireplace and a swimming pool. That's a query, I index that, and then I run the master listing against that index and out pop all of the listings that match the query, right? It's kind of cool. All right, so, uh, and just to make the point, you can actually sort the results by most field types. Most of the, all the numerics and the, alpha, uh, the alphabetics, you can sort your results by those. So let's look at a text search scenario. Uh, this is, an example from Open Search Dashboards, it has something called DevTools tab that enables you just to run stuff directly against Open Search. Great for debugging. As you're setting this up, you'll spend a lot of time in the DevTools tab. It will help you make sure everything's working right. Uh, this is an example of a query here. So it's a REST API. We're doing a get against the search API. Amazon Q&A is the index that we're searching. Simple query string is, as advertised, a way to throw a bunch of words against an index. You'll notice I, I can specify the fields. These are the individual attributes that I'm searching against. I have the ability here to boost. So this caret two after item name boosts the score for matches in the item's name versus the description. This is a very common thing to do to make your relevance work better, figure out which are the important fields, boost them up. Um, I can specify what I want to retrieve. Uh, so that's the source command. I said in this case, we're not gonna retrieve anything. Open Search also supports highlighting. Hit highlighting puts uh, emphasis markers around words that matched in the various fields that you're highlighting. 
We're just doing a smattering of, of kind of examples here of stuff you can do. So this is a search result, and there's, there's more here. There's metadata and other stuff. But this particular result, you can see it comes from, from this index. It has an ID. And then the highlighting here, we matched Egyptian cotton, uh, sheet, set, and queen, and did not match the sateen brown and yellow stripe. Right? So this is a, a way, again, you can throw a bag of words against your index, and you'll come up with an item. You can get more complex. Simple query string, as the name says, is simple. There's also the bool query, which is kind of a Swiss army knife. Bool allows you to specify must, must not, should, and filter clauses. So you can mix multiple clauses, you can nest, uh, and you can match to your heart's content. So in this case, we have a bool query with a filter. We're filtering into the question set. As I said, this is a pretty common pattern like having this way to filter into a particular data set is a good thing. Uh, we must match the age from 18 to 24, so that's a range query on the age, and also cotton in the product description. Uh, in this case, we're retrieving item name, name, and age. Uh, so we have a couple of hits here. You can see we have Aaron Hicks, uh, 23 years old, and Vicki May, 18 years old, and we're matching this uh, cotton sheet set. There's way more that you can do. I can really only scratch the surface today. But these are the, the kind of common things and the ways that you create queries against your data. Now, we do have two use cases. And I'm, out of curiosity, how many of you have some kind of streaming, uh, streaming element to your data, whether it's events or things like that? Yeah, some folks, actually a lot of folks do. So OpenSearch's second major use case is a log analytics platform. And it provides you the ability to flow in log data, build dashboards and visualizations on top of that log data. But actually for any event or streaming source, you can apply the, the same kind of logic to build these, these dashboards. And so for you eventing folks, if you want to build graphs and charts on uh, on attributes within your events, uh, OpenSearch is a tool that can do that as well. So here's a, a, the, the core, the way that this works is the aggregations uh, capability. So here we have a query, we're just matching all the data. We're aggregating then the ASIN and we're gonna have buckets for each ASIN. We're sub-aggregating on the document type. So for each ASIN bucket, I'm able to build an aggregation of the document types, or which in our case is, was it a question, was it an answer? Um, and that gives me um, essentially a histogram, if you want to think of it visually, of for each ASIN, how many answers, how many questions. This is a deep, deep capability. And Open Source is highly optimized to do this kind of work because in the logs world, we want to be able to build dashboards to monitor things in our operations centers. This is a, a sample dashboard running against Apache web logs. You can see we're able to, to have uh, charts and graphs, all kinds of good stuff on them, telling us what's going on in our production website. So again, for the eventing folks, I imagine this is going to be really cool and useful. We mentioned geospatial search. Geospatial search and uh, Jason covered, we're in, in our layout, we need to concatenate the latitude and longitude. In open search uh, ingestion, it's easy to do that with configuration. Open search ingestion also enables you to set the mapping. We'll go into a little bit later. You shouldn't actually use this until your mapping is right. It can be a little bit hard to debug and fix stuff. Um, but you can use it uh, to add a mapping, and open search ingestion will send that uh, template before it sends any data. When you start the pipeline, you stop the pipeline, uh, it'll actually send that before sending the export from Dynamo. So for geo fields, we're going to use the geo point type in this case. Once we map that, and we can answer things like, find me answers from women in Nevada. Um, the bounding box here in the filter that's Nevada. 
and then the gender here is gonna be female. And the answers we get back, uh, Tiffany and David, did I mention this is simulated data? Um, so the genders are actually correct, but the names are random, so. Uh, and they're, they're both a little bit older. But uh, we did get our answers from females in Nevada. So as we heard on uh, Adam's keynote, uh, the whole world is uh, loving the LLMs and uh, the AI ML is booming right now. Um, my background is actually in artificial intelligence but 30 years ago when we did symbolic artificial intelligence. And so uh, it's very different. I actually worked in a natural language processing lab. Uh, my, the, the lab, the person who ran the lab was all about NLP. So I spent a lot of time with NLP. And let me tell you, NLP is hard. And it's amazing, my jaw drop, it's jaw dropping how good these LLMs are in the natural language realm. Um, and really, because of that, we had these chatbots and everybody got excited and we're all still really excited about the possibilities here. When you work with open search, it's really more about bringing the capabilities of the LLM through a vector embedding it generates into open search and employing what we call semantic search. Semantic search is super cool. Search has been doing AI ML for a long time and there are other techniques that you can employ, but this is the big one for now. So with open search, again, you're gonna bring that vector embedding into open search. You have a nearest neighbor algorithm that helps you uh, find semantically relevant objects. How does it work? Well, open search service provides connectors to third party model hosting services. Uh, on the indexing side, you're gonna pull out a chunk of text. Uh, that's gonna be a representative sample for this particular document. You send that off to uh, the third party service. You create a vector embedding add that to your document and index it. On the search side, you do the same thing for the query. You send in your query, you get a vector embedding for that, and you run it into your K nearest neighbors index, you do a nearest neighbor search, and you get search results. Now, open search itself provides what we call neural plugin that automates all of that back and forth to the model hosting service, makes it easier to do. So, on the ingestion and configuration side, uh, one of the things you can do is use ingestion to create your chunk. In this case, I pulled together, I just concatenated a bunch of stuff from the item name and the product description and the questions and answers and added that as an entry. In my configuration, I first say that this is a KNN uh, index. My NLP pipeline is what's gonna do that back and forth to bedrock. And then I have my embedding, uh, which is gonna take the vector, right? So I modify my uh, config a little bit, my, my mapping, and I can flow all this data in and I get um, vector data, right? So I, really, I just tried this one at random. What sheet should I use if I have a cat? And now, you know, like in the back of my head, I'm thinking like, yeah, cats, hair, you know, like w what's gonna help with that? right? And I was actually startled to see this answer come up. I have a Maine Coon and the hair sticks to everything. But these sheets are great. I love this. This is like so, this is where the magic really is, right? That's cool. Um, and, and funny enough, the, the answers or the questions are all about dogs, right? So this wasn't even a direct text match. Um, and the top five answers here mention fur. So somehow, what sheet should I use if I have a cat? Intuits, I don't know, that I'm thinking about hair and it's messy. So those are just some examples. Like we've barely been able to scratch the surface today. <clears throat> Open search is a really rich and deep tool and you could do a lot with it. So let's talk a little bit about the integration and the how to's and the best practice. I'm gonna hold questions to the end if I could. Thank you. Um, we covered a little bit on the advanced pipeline architectures. Uh, Data Prepper itself is a very, very uh, flexible tool. So you can actually use pipelines as sinks for your pipelines. I imagine this is going to come up in a lot of cases where you have different sort keys that you want to send to different indices and maybe handle and process a little bit differently. Again, you can also route data uh, 
conditionally on the contents of that data to various indices. And that provides you with the ability of splitting the data out and not having to do a filter itself, but having an index of whatever. So some of our, uh, you know, uh, war stories, yeah. best practices. This is we've, the best we've part used of the all this uh, <laughs> in the run-up, and so we want to make sure we give you the, the best advice. Right. Yeah. These are all because we have scars. We've, <laughs> yeah, we been, have we've scars. been playing over the last uh, month. Um, so the first thing is, if you're going to get started, create a mapping in OpenSearch. Um, the, create your index. When you create your index, you'll create your mapping. You want to establish your pipeline then and make sure that data is flowing through by using the console, probably, to create an item in DynamoDB, make sure it goes all the way across, make sure it lands in OpenSearch, make sure the mapping is correct, um, and the connection is working. Then you want to go to Dashboards and use the DevTools tab to run a few queries to make sure that, again, the mapping is right. You can write the queries you want to write. This will give you basic sanity for the whole pipeline. And when everything is correct, you can move your mapping into your uh, op open search ingestion config, delete out your index, and start flowing your data to Dynamo. Right. For example, when I did the GeoPoint, I let it just go first as a string. Open search says, well, that looks like a string. And then I said, no, it's actually a, a GeoPoint. Right, I guess it was the location of GeoPoint. And it says, no, it's a string. I already saw it as a string. You're like, no, 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 you're wrong. It says, no, I'm right. So what he's saying is go to open search first and say, here is everything. Yeah correctly the first time, instead of letting it implicitly, the first time it sees something, assume it's a string if you didn't mean it as a string. Or if the string happens to be one, two, three, open search will say, that's a number. You're like, no, it's not. It just happens to be a number this time, but the second one's going to be a real string. So go to open search, tell it what's coming, and then feed it. Key point being, once, your map, once you set the mapping and a field has some data in it, you cannot change it in open search. You must re-index, right? So, OpenSearch does not support changing the schema after data is already in it. So it's very important, this step, to get the schema right, the mapping right, and then send your data and make sure it works. Uh, just some other sort of generic stuff. You can enable CloudWatch logs on OpenSearch uh, service and OpenSearch ingestion. Uh, on the service, you can get application logs. These will surface errors or things that are happening uh, at the OpenSearch side. In the ingestion, you can see stuff that's happening in the ingestion pipeline. Always use a dead letter queue. Uh, this is, again, just a config in open search ingestion. You just specified dead letter queue. It's an S3 bucket. Failed deliveries go to that S3 bucket. Um, so super helpful for debugging and, of course, even running in production, you want to have that dead letter queue. If you need to change your mapping or you need to change something in the configuration, we recommend stop the pipeline if it's a mapping, delete the index, and then start the pipe, change your config, and then start the pipeline, which will re-export the data from Dynamo uh, and send it over to OpenSearch. You have a, a challenge with debugging that Dynamo won't stream changes that are not actually changes. So once your data is in Dynamo, it's hard to make it go again. And this way, starting and stopping the pipeline will re-export that data and will flow it across again. Um, you can add a second sync, Jason mentioned as well. Uh, it, it's nothing more than four lines of config in open search ingestion. And your data is then delivered to two different locations, open search and then S3 has a record of everything. Probably you're not going to do that in production, uh, but for de debugging, developing, testing, uh, it's great to see what open search ingestion is emitting, making make sure it's the right thing. I'm going to say uh, three minutes on sizing. Actually, I've done two-hour talks on sizing. So, but I want to give you some clues, something to think about. If I'm sizing OpenSearch, I have this pipeline flowing. What am I going to do? So OpenSearch supports a number of different data node types. And again, this is for managed domains. If you're serverless, you don't have to think about any of this stuff. Um, with managed domains, our recommendation here that we support more instance types than this, but our recommendation, first of all, is to use Graviton instances. Uh, second of all, the C-series, C6s, are actually gr good performers if you're a search workload. Uh, the R6s are good overall performers. And the IM4GNs, if you're an event stream, IM4GNs are not only Graviton, but they have on-instance SSD. They'll provide you with 
a 30 terabyte disk at the largest size. So if you have a ton of data, probably IM4GN is relevant. When, you, when we do sizing, we start with storage. So we say, okay, how much storage do we need? Um, there's a 10% inflation, 10 to 30. It kind of depends on your data, your mapping, and all of that. Um, so we're going to say your source data size times 1.1. You should run with at least one replica in OpenSearch. The replica provides you redundancy. OpenSearch makes sure to distribute the primary and the replica to different data nodes so that you, you have two copies in the domain, but that doubles your need for storage. Then you have a 15% overhead um, where OpenSearch complains if you get into that range. So you want to make sure you keep at least 15% free space. Once you have a disk and a, a disk need, that will help you on the instance size. Um, you have to be able to deploy a large enough instance to get that big an EBS volume. Um, we then have to go to CPU. The really simplistic way to think about CPU is that each shard is going to occupy a CPU for any work it does. So I have my index, say I have five primary shards and, I, and one replica, which is 10 total shards. I send an indexing request and let's say it's a bulk, there's a bunch of documents. Every shard has to do work, right? So I need 10 CPUs to process that indexing request. If I send a query, I'm only going to hit one of the each copy of each of the shards, so I need only five CPUs. For simplicity, we just say, okay, we're going to just assume every shard is 100% occupying some CPU. So how many shards do you have? Well, our recommendation is for searchy kind of workloads that you keep them smaller, about 30 gig max. For logs -y or event -y kind of workloads, you can go as big as 50 gigabytes. So now I can take my, sor my storage, which is the same as the size I need. I can divide by 30 gigabytes. That tells me how many primary shards I need. I add the replica, and then I set the instance size based on the uh, one and a half times the shard count. Now, why one and a half times? Well, you don't want 100% of your CPUs occupied 100% of the time, your cluster will die. So we put you at about two thirds utilization as a target, right? One and a half, me, you know, one over one and a half is two thirds, right? So two thirds utilization is what we're shooting for. Um, so you want to pick an instance size based on the CPU count and scale it that way. Um, of course. <laughs> You could use Amazon <laughs> Service. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's good sales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we mentioned OCUs. Uh, open Search Ingestion uh, the, is, is, again, an auto-scaled solution. An OCU is a single worker uh, in your ingestion pipeline. Uh, open Search Ingestion charges based on OCU hours. Um, so this is the core kind of element. You could set a min and a max. Uh, one is the minimum, 96 is the maximum. You don't have to. Open search ingestion is auto-scaled, so you could let it scale for you. But you can set a limit if you want to do cost control. Uh, the team has asked me, please, to caveat this. So uh, your mileage will vary. And uh, we can give you some guidelines that are generic, but these are not absolutely correct, right? But just for an idea, your throughput per OCU for normal cases is something like five megabytes a second per OCU. Actual sizing depends on data size, data velocity, the pipeline manipulations that you're doing, the open search service domain size, the indexing and sharding strategy. There's a lot of it depends here. But this is a reasonable expectation. If we map that uh, into Dynamo world, we would expect one OCU to be able to support about 5,000 WCUs. So that's it. Um, Dynamo offers features that make integrating and uh, replicating with other data stores relatively easy. Not only OpenSearch, Redshift was just announced as well. Um, with OpenSearch and Dynamo in tandem, you get all of the capabilities of Dynamo with rich search, relevance, text-to-text -text matching, ranges, sorting, geo, all of these cool things. And open search ingestion is your way to make it easy to bring data from Dynamo to open search, including the change data capture, the export, initial bootstrap. 
uh, simple to do. And with open search, again, you get all of these lovely search features like full text, geo, NLP, semantic, all of that. We're available 15 regions today, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks.